Why did you want to be an astronaut? Actually, I'll, I'll correct you. Many people have asked me that question, but it may be the first time I get to tell you the answer. <laughs> uh, I believed growing up that we would all be astronauts by the time I was, you know, an adult. That's not true, obviously, and we're not as advanced as I thought we would be. Um, but I believed when I was young that that would be my place for some period of time in my life was to do that. And I think when I went through university, I, I'm a geologist, a geophysicist, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if I learned about rocks, minerals, and geology, and then we went to the moon and I could help, you know, utilize resources on the moon because of my geological experiences and background. Um, so those were the things that interested me, and, you know, I was always interested in jets and flying and, you know, watching the Apollo guys walk on the moon. You know, that was, those were the things that, that interested me and that, that really caught my attention. So I just thought that we would all, as a race, be advancing to where it was standard for people to be spacefarers, you know, space explorers. I want to get you to take us along that course, but mm. first let's start at the beginning. Tell me about your hometown. Tell me about where you grew up. Okay, so I, I grew up in Lake Orion, Michigan from the age of 10, which is a suburb of Detroit. And before that, uh, lived in Royal Oak, Michigan, also a suburb of Detroit. Lake Orion was a little farther away. Um, you have fond memories of summer and winter. You know, I think winters were quite enjoyable. Uh, we used to do a lot of snowmobiling uh, and snow skiing, and in the summers we spent our time uh, water skiing. Um, and being a suburb of Detroit, Motor City, um, I became interested in automobiles at an early age. My father and uncle were both uh, engineers at Ford uh, Motor Company, and so uh, when you grow up in Detroit in the Motor City and everybody works for the auto industry, you, I think, have a natural affinity to, to like vehicles and cars and, um, you know, raced motorcycles at a young age, um, raced bicycle motocross at a young age, and raced go-karts for you know, a number of years uh, after I got out of high school. So I was always interested in doing those things, mechanical things, and worked as a mechanic uh, at, a, at a shop outside of Detroit. So that's sort of what my childhood was like. It was you know, doing all those uh, fun things, but a lot of it revolved around motorsports and, and um, you know, working on mechanical objects. That place and those people had a real impact on, on the person that you turn out to be. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, m yeah, very directly. Yep. Did you get a chance to see it on your last flight? Uh, I believe that the, the, you know, the time I've spent in my life working with tools and uh, familiarity with, with with tools in that environment allowed me to be at ease with the things I was doing, you know, working with my hands when it came to that. Not so much with the space walking stuff, because that's new to everybody, but um, I didn't have to focus as much on, you know, the actual tasks themselves. I mean, clearly they were important and critical, but it, it didn't require as much of my concentration, and that allowed me to, you know, expand it to, to uh, to understand what else was happening around me, like the fact that the Earth was spinning below us and we're, you know, traveling at 17,000 miles an hour above it and all those things, you know, that was, it gave me a little more time to appreciate that, I think. What kind of a view did you have of, of home from space? Well, I was pretty good uh, on STS-125. We were 300 or so miles up, which is uh, roughly 100 miles higher than the, where the space station flies. So we had a broader view of the Earth. Um, unfortunately, because of the orbit of Hubble, we stayed fairly close to the equator of the planet. So we were roughly 25 degrees on either side of the equator, whereas a space station mission goes all the way up to 55 degrees. So whereas a space station will fly over, you know, parts of Canada, um, the Hubble, for, on the Hubble mission, we really didn't get any farther north than, you know, Cocoa Beach, Florida. You know, that, that was it. So the view is, is, is higher and broader, uh, but we don't... Uh, ultimately see as much of the planet because we don't fly as high north and south of the equator. You didn't get a chance to look straight down at Right. The you see things at a very oblique angle, which was also very beautiful because some of, you know, some of my best memories of space, I have 
I've had really three or four. And one of the best ones was um, during a spacewalk, flying over just about New Orleans and looking north and seeing Michigan, you know, my home state. I could see it in the distance and it was just beautiful. It was really a slight angle so I could see the Great Lakes and it was just falling into the shadow, you know, of darkness. But it was just a beautiful, beautiful sight. I thought, hey, that's pretty neat. That's my home, you know, that's my state. I can see, you know, where I, where I grew up practically or at least whereabouts. And the other, one of the other great memories was flying over Houston and my first DVA right at the end of the, the last, uh, you know, right at the end of the spacewalk on the robotic arm, but I was facing the Earth and the shuttle was behind me. So there was nothing between myself and the Earth except my visor and just looking straight down at Houston. I mean, I could see everything. I could see, you know, maybe I couldn't see it, but I, I certainly could identify where Beltway 8 was and 610 and all the freeways leading in, you know, and I could clearly look right down at Clear Lake where, you know, my house would be just about. So that was pretty neat. Um, and then Hawaii, seeing Hawaii from space was pretty, pretty spectacular. Good, vivid memories of that as well. You touched on this. Let me get you to tell us, to sketch out your, uh, your educational and your professional mm -hmm. career that led you to be here and to be asking. Uh, I left high school and uh, stayed home. I went to Oakland Community College uh, for three years to get a degree in geological, well, it's an associate science degree, a, a two-year science degree. I did that in three years, specializing in geology with a minor in um, industrial design. So you could say I was pursuing two careers, one as a scientist, one as an automotive designer. And those are the two things I wanted to do, and I, I chose the scientific path over the, I guess what you could say, artistic path. Um, but while working, uh, or while going to school at the community college, I also worked as a, a automo automobile rest restoration you know, mechanic uh, in a shop uh, it was called uh, International Auto Works, and we restored 1950s Jaguars, and that's all we did. We get these cars in and uh, strip them down to just the frame and the shells, and send them off for uh, metal stripping and then we would just slowly rebuild those cars with new pieces and parts and, and, and make vehicles out of them. So that was, you know, three-year job while working uh, and going to school at the same time. I worked a few summers after that, but once I left Oakland Community College, I went to Purdue and uh, pursued a bachelor's degree in uh, geophysics or solid, solid earth sciences, so still geology but with a specialty on geophysics, which is um, sort of like the physics of the earth or or using physics to sense what's you know underneath the surface of the earth and uh, so with the credits from Oakland Community College transferred to Purdue I spent three years uh, getting the other two years of my degree for a for a you know, bachelor's degree in, in geophysics uh, stayed there to do a master's degree in geophysics and uh, then went on to um, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario for my PhD in seismology. And there I studied uh, underground mining seismology and uh, spent some time working in uh, mines in Canada and in the U.S. Uh, installing seismic monitoring or what you could consider earthquake monitoring systems in underground mines. Um, so I, you know, that was a four-year program for a PhD. Um, Worked a few years after that for a small uh, engineering uh, consulting firm uh, in Kingston, Ontario, uh, and uh, and then came down to Houston to work for Exxon uh, Exxon Mobil Corporation as a uh, geophysical operations specialist and um, you know doing oil and gas exploration uh, here in the U.S. and actually worldwide uh, um, surveys um, that lasted about three and a half years. And in 2000, I was selected as an astronaut. So it's been 10 years since that point, and here we are on uh, the second flight, STS-134. And the flying in space part of your chosen career is one that we know has the possibility of dangers. So hmm. I need to ask Drew, what is it that you think that we're getting as a result of flying people in space that makes it worth doing it? I think it's just that. It's flying humans in space. It's flying us off the planet. It's considering the possibility of a different home besides Earth, ultimately, for the human species. Um, I think for humans, it's always been about 
what's out there? Are we alone? Um, could we be the only ones in this infinite universe? And I think the only way we're going to find out is if we keep pushing the boundary and trying to get out there. And, and this is just the beginning. I mean, we're, we're barely getting off our own planet. But someday, you know, if we continue this and technology continues and as we get smarter or better at adapting to the world around us and the universe around us, we will be traveling, you know, throughout the universe doing amazing different things. And so I think what, you know, why is it worth it? It's, it's worth it be, because we can and we're capable and we're getting better at it. And someday it'll be, it'll be just like I thought it was supposed to be when I was a kid, um, that we all fly in space all the time and travel through, this, through the universe. You're a member of the crew on space shuttle mission STS-134. Drew, summarize the overall goals of this flight and tell me what your job is going to be. So the overall goals of this flight, that's a, that's a pretty big question. I'll try to summarize it. Uh, our main uh, uh, payload is the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is a science payload that we're carrying in the shuttle uh, to place on the external truss of the space station. That's a payload that's it's a two billion dollar payload with 16 countries uh, participating and some 500 scientists uh, to that have worked over the past probably 20 years to develop this experiment. Um, and it's a follow-on to AMS-1, uh, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer 1 that flew on space shuttle uh, early on. So this is a follow-on experiment to that but it will be permanently uh, placed on the space station to hopefully collect data, uh, high energy particle physics data. Um, for the life of the remaining life of the space station. So that is our primary payload. Uh, we're launching six crew members to space, uh, all males, one uh, European astronaut, Roberto Vittori. And uh, during the mission, we'll do um, four EVAs now. Uh, none of them are associated with AMS, uh, but they all are, I guess, what you could call standard uh, space station uh, repair or um, maintenance uh, EVA activities. Yeah. All of your crewmates uh, have been to the space station before. All six of you, of course, have flown in space before. Uh, two of them have actually done long duration mm -hmm. missions on the station. Does that benefit the group in getting prepared for this flight? I think so. Yeah, we have a unique crew in that sense. So if you if you look at the makeup of our crew, we have three space shuttle uh, flyers, uh, myself, uh, Mark Kelly, and uh, Greg Johnson. Um, Greg Shamatov also flew on space shuttle, but not as a crew member. He was flying up to do his long duration mission to spend six months on station. Mike Fink has never flown on a space shuttle, uh, but he's lived on space station for a year, um, but only flown on the Soyuz vehicle. Uh, Roberto Vittori's uh, made two trips to the space station, but never for a long long term, so I think maybe he spent a week at a time up on the space station, also only flown with the Russians. So um, there's a lot of experience, but we have varied experience, and I myself have never seen the space station. I've only flown to Hubble, which is a completely different type of a mission. So um, for all of us, although we have a lot of experience, very few of us have the same experiences. So um, that has benefited us in many ways uh, preparing, so everybody has a different way that they approach um, tasks and objectives um, and also problems and I think that's been a positive thing. There's been a lot of growing pains with us or you know learning about each other and the ways that we've done things in the past and all of our experiences uh, but I think overall it's made us a stronger crew with, with uh, you know more ways to approach problems. Well let's talk about some of the cargo that you're bringing to the okay. station. Start with the uh, Express Logistics Carrier 3. Tell okay. me what that is. Expr Express Logistics Carrier 3, we call it ELC 3. It's one of four that will live permanently on the space station, and essentially they are um, storage shelves for spare parts for the space station. One of the components on our express logistics carrier is a, uh, a robotics arm called uh, SPDM, a special purpose dexterous manipulator, I believe. And uh, what that allows the Canada Arm 2 um, that lives on space station to do is uh, perform tasks that are normally done by spacewalkers. So it gives it, in a sense, uh, arms and hands and allows it to um, carry out activities that we would normally do, uh, but over a much longer period of time with significant input from a ground control team. So that's, uh, that's one of the components. That's probably one of the main components that we see on our um, ELC uh, component. Uh, 
but overall, those pieces are, you know, spare parts racks for the space station. So what does it take for you and your crewmates to install it, get it out of the payload bay and up on the top side of the truss wheel? Uh, it's robotically installed. There are no EVA activities associated with installing uh, an ELC uh, rack. And uh, what we do is use the uh, Space Shuttle Canada arm to lift the component out of the Space Shuttle payload bay and uh, place it in a position that allows Canada Arm 2 from the space station to come over and grab a hold of uh, the LC and we call that a handoff and then they take it and move it on to its uh, permanent location on space station. The other major component that's riding up in your payload bay is the alpha magnetic spectrometer. Mm -hmm. uh, you touched on that a moment ago. Tell me more. Tell me about what this does from its perch out on the station's truss. I'll give you the uh, my best uh, description as a non particle physicist, um, if I can. Um, it's a fairly large component. It, it is roughly the size of the payload bay in, in uh, diameter, um, which, which I guess makes it about 12 feet across or so. And, um, and it's, it's sort of round shaped like a donut, you can think of it as that, and, and its job is to uh, detect particles, uh, cosmic rays and, and particles in space that pass through the magnet. And the magnet's uh, function is to bend the particles as they pass through um, the middle of this donut to help um, detect or characterize what those particles are. And AMS is designed to look uh, for dark matter uh, in the universe, um, which essentially makes up 70 percent of the universe. We believe it does based on estimates of planet sizes and stars and gravitational you know pull the way we understand it we think there's a lot more matter and energy out there than we can see dark dark matter and dark energy so AMS's goal is to uh, characterize those high energy particles um, and try to determine which of those are antimatter and specifically I think it's tuned to anti helium and anti carbon um, and then also to look at, um, so to characterize each particle that passes through it based on its, its mass, its charge, and its total energy. And so there are, there's a series of detectors, kind of like a cake, you know, built like a layer cake inside that um, device that as the particles pass through the middle, each of these layers has a different function to help characterize the mass, the charge, or the energy of that, of that particle that's passing through it to determine what it really is. Um, the advantage of it is that um, on Earth we, can, we build particle accelerators um, and try to, with magnets, accelerate particles around a ring and eventually smash those into a detector or another particle to, to make new particles. Um, but we really can't reach the um, level of energy um, that, that's desired and in space we have very high energy particles that are always present. Um, that don't get attenuated by the Earth's atmosphere or magnetic field. So this is sort of a, a, a raw, original place to measure these, we call it like an in situ measurement of these high energy particles. Um, so that sits out there on the space station truss and these high energy particles with very high velocities, you know, faster than we can accelerate them on Earth, are passing through this detector at all times and then, and then we use the different layers in there to characterize what those particles are. So it's something that we believe we can achieve on Earth. Um, in terms of creating the particles to then characterize what they are. I think the next question though is, is why? Why do we want to detect those particles? What's the, what's the significance of what it's looking for? Uh, well, you know, that's sort of a philo philosophical question. I mean, that's a question of science. Why do we explore anything? So it's, in a sense, it's exploration uh, of, the, of the universe. And it's a way for us to help uh, determine what is out there. You know, what is the universe made made of? Where did it all start? Similar to what Hubble does. You know, Hubble Telescope looking back at the origins of the universe um, by characterizing these particles that we can't see, we can't detect, we can only infer on Earth. Um, by trying to search for them in space, we may better define and understand. You know, what is the makeup of the universe? What is its origins? How did it develop? And where is it? Where is it headed? So that's the only significance, huh? Well, that's the significance <laughs> that I can relate to. I'm sure there's much, much more, but uh, it's an important uh, experiment, yeah. Talk about the procedure. How does AMS get out of the payload bay and into its position? AMS is positioned uh, similar to what the ELC pallet is, or really any, any payload that um, flies to space station in the back of the shuttle payload bay. So we use the, sh the shuttle's Canada arm to lift it out of the payload bay, and Canada arm, too, comes over and picks it up and uh, does a handoff and places it up high on the truss. And in particular, it's uh, sitting on an inboard location of one of the starboard side trusses. 
So if you're looking at the front of the space station, it would be on the left, uh, on the top of, uh, of the truss. Which is presumably where the cosmic rays are coming from. Well, you know, I'm not so sure that it matters uh, where it's positioned. That happened to be the best position from a thermal standpoint and also an available place to put it because, of course, those particles are coming from all different directions, really, up, uh, up there. The plan for this mission, as you said, calls for three, uh, rather four spacewalks by three teams mm -hmm. of spacewalkers. Mm -hmm. What's your role in, the, in the, this group activity? So we do have uh, three teams of spacewalkers, and I was uh, fortunate to be assigned as EV-1, or the lead spacewalker on this mission. And uh, uh, I, I'm heading up a team of two others, uh, Mike Fink and Greg Chamatoff, both who are long duration uh, space station members. Uh, Greg has not previously done a spacewalk, so he's really looking forward to this opportunity to do two spacewalks on the mission. And Mike Fink will be um, working, we'll be working together with Mike on uh, the three other uh, spacewalks for the mission. So um, e EVA-1 is uh, myself and Greg Shamatoff. EVA-2 is, uh, is myself and Mike Fink. EVA-3 is myself and Mike Fink. And then EVA-4 is, is Mike Fink and uh, Greg Shamatoff. So um, that's the way it's playing out. And uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting to lead somebody. Greg, uh, Mike Fink was a commander of the space station. So as a, as a lead spacewalker, it's, it's interesting, and it, I think it's neat for us to work together. I mean, he's a former commander, and I'm sort of the lead EVA spacewalker. So there's a lot of great information that's that's built into that team. You know, we've all got a lot of experience. He's done, I believe, six Orlon EVAs in the Russian spacesuit. Um, so he has spacewalking experience, just not in a U.S. spacesuit. And during the, the spacewalks, the one of you that's not outside is going to be running things inside, That's right. right. The, the, uh, the person who's not outside is, is I guess you could saw, say, the uh, quarterback or the, uh, you know, the director inside uh, working from the shuttle um, flight deck, uh, reading the choreography of the steps and, you know, trying to keep us on track on the timeline, telling us which tax, tasks are next and, and uh, how to And carry it keeps on. all of you familiar with all of four EVAs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does. It really helps in that sense because, and we've also cross-trained in the uh, neutral buoyancy lab as well, so we all have a good understanding of what the spacewalkers are going through. And the, and as spacewalkers, you do need to have some appreciation of what you're putting the um, the IV crew member or the you know the quarterback inside through, because there are a lot of tasks, there are a lot of activities. Uh, we're not always working. Uh, in unison, sometimes we get split up, and so the individual inside is responsible for the two of us and keeping us on track, um, and also coordinating with ground control. So there is a significant amount of effort that goes on inside the space shuttle, trying to keep the people outside, you know, working productively and not getting behind them, uh, so that, that things can keep moving. Let's talk about what's on the plan, uh, at least as we as we talk yeah. today. First spacewalk, uh, you and Greg are, mm -hmm. are outside. What's That's on the right. plan for EVA-1? So the big plan, uh, EVA-1, the, the first uh, couple of objectives involve the MISSIs, which are experiments, uh, static experiments, some are powered, some are not, that, that sit out on the space station trusses and uh, are open to space. And they're, they essentially capture um, space particles as well. Not in the same way that AMS does, but they they have uh, exposed surfaces in them. Um, they sort of call them exposed facilities. So they have materials. They may have ma different materials in there, or metals, or fabrics, or gels, or whatever that they're either looking at the effects of space on those materials, or actually trying to capture, you know, little particles for later analysis, you know, within gels or some some material like that. So. Uh, on the first spacewalk, uh, Greg Shemitoff and I will go out and retrieve two that have been out there uh, for, I believe, over a year or about a year or so by the time we get to them. And then we'll, we'll uh, place two, two new ones out uh, in those same locations. Um, that's first. And then uh, what's next for us on that day is to set up for EVA-2, which involves filling, some, uh, filling ammonia back into one of the radiators that has leaked out over a number of years. Um, so we'll spend EVA-1 uh, preparing for those activities on, on EVA-2. And then we'll end the day with work on the, uh, the U.S. laboratory and node section where we're laying out some uh, wireless antennas that are actually designed to communicate with the ELC pallets. And these are new antennas. So there's some wiring and cabling involved with that uh, that takes up the last couple of hours of that EVA. Let's give you an opportunity to 
crawl around a significant portion of the station? It does. We'll, uh, we'll be traversing uh, from one end to the other of the space station on just about every EVA except for EVA um, 3. And uh, that'll be new for me because, of course, on the Hubble mission, I, we lived in the back of the payload bay, and Hubble wasn't very far. And, and uh, on the space station mission, you, you, spend a, you know, get a lot of mileage out of the, uh, a lot out of the suit. Two days after the first spacewalk, uh, Mike and Greg are swapping places and, uh, for, the, for the second EVA. Mm -hmm. What are the jobs for, uh, for you outside on EVA number two? So uh, Mike Fink and I go out on EVA two. Mike Fink comes out the door first. We call him uh, essentially EV one for the day. And, and we each take turns you know, leading each day's uh, activities. Um, so we go out on uh, EVA two. And that whole day is really dedicated to two things, uh, filling the um, port radiator with, uh, refilling a, one of the port radiators with ammonia and uh, rotate, uh, lubricating the uh, solar array rotary joint on the uh, port side of the space station. That's something that's been done in the past. Uh, we have uh, in, in history uh, three or four times now, I think, actually uh, rotated the solar, solar array rotary joints. And that involves removing some covers and using an actual grease gun uh, with some special lubricant to uh, provide grease for this uh, bearing surface that rotates in space. And then the ammonia fill uh, is also a very time-consuming job. Not a lot of work to do aside from opening and closing valves and mating and demating ammonia lines, but that in itself is fairly um, tricky and wrought with peril. So we will, um, we will uh, do our best. You know, we've trained hard uh, for that uh, activity and uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to not let any ammonia leak out at the, because if it does, that involves some other actions on our part um, to allow that ammonia to, uh, to what we call bake out or uh, sublimate off of the spacesuits before we go back inside. It's not a substance we like to take inside of the space station with us. Is that lube job on the rotary joint not exactly what you learned as a kid working on cars? Was well, it? it's probably exactly what I learned working <laughs> on cars. Right? The grease guns look the same. It looks like a Dude. caulking gun, but uh, the concept is the same. I mean, I, and I think all of us understand that pretty well, you know, what we're trying to do. Carrying out is, uh, is always a little bit more challenging in space. For a while now, when spacewalks done on the station, prior to the spacewalk the night before, spacewalkers have camped out mm -hmm. in the uh, airlock as a way to uh, get their bodies ready to fight against any decompression sickness. Hey. Before the third EVA on this mission, you're looking at trying out a different pre-breathe protocol. Mm -hmm. Tell us a, a little bit about what this, this new procedure is. Right, so we, uh, we were introduced to uh, a pre-breathe option uh, by Mike Gernhardt, uh, uh, an astronaut in the Corps, and it's called the In-Suit Light Exercise Pre-Breathe Protocol. We call it ISLE, I-S-L-E for In-Suit Light Exercise Protocol. And it offers us, uh, as you mentioned, what we typically do for a space station mission is uh, we camp out in the station's airlock uh, with at a lower pressure um, to allow our bodies to um, purge the nitrogen that's that's in the, in our blood uh, stream, and then in the morning uh, when we uh, wake up and start to prepare for the EVA and have to allow other crew members to come in to help us, we have to put on um, oxygen, 100% you know, oxygen breathing masks, and maintain that oxygen seal around our face so that we don't introduce more nitrogen back into our blood. Um, we have another option aside from camp out, which is called exercise pre-breathe protocol, which doesn't involve capping out at uh, 10.2 PSI overnight in the airlock, but involves us waking up in the morning, uh, donning an oxygen mask and riding a bicycle for 10 minutes at a fairly high level of exertion to, uh, to uh, you know, get the 100% oxygen flowing through our blood and then purging that nitrogen by doing exercise. Um, and now we have a third option, which is called the in-suit light exercise pre-breathe protocol, which involves us having a normal sleep period the night before, waking up in the morning, and then um, donning the spacesuit, so getting into the spacesuit like we normally would, um, and then um, decreasing the pressure in the airlock and having the pressure, the, the suits at, at that nominal pressure, and then performing exercise in the suits. And it's not really exercise as much as it is just moving your arms and legs uh, for a certain period of time to, so now you've got the advantage of you're on 100% oxygen uh, and you're at a lower pressure and you're exercising. So you're sort of combining the 
the airlock camp out pre-breathe with the exercise pre-breathe with the suit itself. And you're already in the suit. And you're already in the suit, right. So that, that sort of avoids exercising on a bike or camping out overnight. It just puts you in the suit, starts you moving your arms and legs while you're breathing 100% O2 at a lower pressure, and all those things combined allow us to go out the door and have, as you mentioned, better protection against um, decompression sickness uh, symptoms. Uh, while we're outside working at those at those uh, lower pressures. Is the activity in the suit does a normal pre-EVA activities or is there something special that you have to um, do? It's a little bit special. I had somebody tell me today, our uh, uh, one of our suit trainers, uh, she mentioned that we we're going to do the hokey pokey in the suit. <laughs> so <laughs> pretty simple activities. Um, we're just going to we're just going to move our arms, move our legs a little bit, and uh, try to get the blood flowing a little more than we normally would, uh, and sort of wait there and purposely do it. So it's really not much more than the things you would normally do, moving your arms and legs as you get into the suit, but it's, it's purposely taking those actions to ensure that you've covered yourself and provided that level of protection against decompression sickness. Okay, the plan is to do this before the third space walk, which is mm -hmm. you and Mike going which back Which is outside. Mike and Mike and I, yeah. What what are you going to do well, outside we're, for number three? Uh, EVA number three was a late ad, you know, so we've been training for um, about a year now together, and all along up until um, probably a month and a half ago, we had been training three EVAs, and we've just added this fourth EVA. And this involves um, installing a power and data grapple fixture or uh, a base for Canada Arm 2. So the Canada Arm, you know, space station arm, has a capability of walking around the space station from end to end to do different tasks. The Russian segment doesn't really have any of those bases for the arm to walk onto. And this is an opportunity for us to actually attach one of these base station mechanisms onto the, um, what we call the FGB functional cargo block portion of the space station to allow the arm to walk onto that position and you know do some tasks in areas that it wouldn't have been able to reach you know previous to this so this is an activity that's been on the book I believe on the books for a number of years and uh, hasn't found a home and we think we found an uh, opportunity to do it then uh, on our mission the advantage to doing it uh, on our mission on EVA 3 is that Mike Fink has just spent a considerable amount of time on the Russian segment in the Orlan spacesuit. So by having he and I go out on that task, he has some familiarity back there that, that I don't have. Um, and so that, that's an advantage to us as a team to get out there and do that work. And this was actually in the plan for the summer of 2010 and got delayed because of of a different of, of a different issue on right, the station. Right, right. It got it got pushed off, so it, it fell, and that's not uncommon for uh, you know the stuff to roll downhill and land on the next uh, point of opportunity, which which happened to be us. And that's going to be your task being for the entirety of EVA three. Uh, it is essentially that's the main task. Although we have uh, some other cable routing, uh, which we're calling Y cables, um, for for lack of a better word, but they're essentially two cables. Um, that have a Y split in them. They're, they're fairly long, but they also uh, are strung along um, the Russian module and part of the U.S. Uh, module right where the connection's made uh, with the, the node, what we call node one, and the Russian module. And these are redundant power supply cables for the Russian segment. So we're going to uh, uh, install two of those and allow their, you know, provide the capability for redundant power supply to the portions of the Russian segment. Okay, then the last EVA, number four, this would be Mike and Greg going yep. outside. Um, what's on the schedule for this, the last EVA? And Greg is going out first for that EVA, and that'll be this, the second of his uh, spacewalks, um, the third for, uh, for Mike Fink. And that, the primary focus of that EVA is to leave the space shuttle um, boom the OBSS, the device that we use to extend the capabilities of the space shuttle robotic arm. Um, that lives on the, um, on the starboard side of the space shuttle payload bay. And when we do inspections of the, the belly of the orbiter, uh, we use the robotic arm to take that boom out. And it's got some cameras on the end of it. And we use it to extend you know, what the capabilities of the arm are uh, as, it, as it looks around the different components of the, uh, of the shuttle. We're going to leave that boom on space station uh, just in the case that the space station ever has need for a extended 
you know, Canada arm too. If for some reason they want their arm to be longer, um, this device will be on the space station. Um, we will change the grapple fixture that's on the end of the boom. Right now it's designed to accept the space shuttle robotic arm, but we're going to put a new fixture on the end, um, which is again one of these power data grapple fixtures, PDGF, the same component that we're putting on the Russian segment. We're going to apply one of these devices uh, at the end of the boom uh, and leave it resident on space station in case the station arm wants to use the boom. Tell me about where it's going to go and, and what it takes to prepare that site. Um, it will live, it's been left one time before, uh, I believe STS-123 left a uh, boom uh, on orbit and it, it lives essentially right on top of the U.S. segments on the truss. So it's sort of on S0 and S1, so the starboard side, you know, just just to the left of the long axis of the space station um, up on the truss and involves uh, coordination with the Canada arm, uh, the space station arm to um, place the boom in a position where uh, Mike and Greg are, uh, are ready to receive the boom into some, what we call them, we call them gun racks, but they're essentially a set of jaws that grab onto fixtures that are on the boom and, and close down like hands that hold it in place. And, and they, you know, tighten down those fixtures and secure it into place. So four spacewalks is a, it's a pretty busy, we'll be busy. busy uh, time yeah. for you all. Uh, but that's not unlike what you were experienced on your first flight. That's right. On, you know, for the STS-125 mission, we did five spacewalks and we didn't have a day in between as a break. I personally did, so I did EVAs one, three, and five with a day off in between. And on days two and four, I was inside, you know, doing the choreography for the for the next event. On this mission, of course, we, we do uh, our spacewalks, our um, days uh, five, seven, nine, and 11. So there's always a day in between still, um, but we're not filling that with another team, you know, doing EVA. So we all sort of get a day off in between instead of just half of the EVA team, which will be nice. Something else new, uh, during rendezvous and docking, and then again, after undocking and fly around, your crew's gathering data for what's called the development test objective known as STORM, which stands for Sensor Test for Orion Relative Navigation Risk Mitigation. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you knew I, the, the I read full that. I read words that. of the acronym. <laughs> yeah, we just call it STORM. Uh, this will include a re-rendezvous mm -hmm. with the station mm -hmm. after the separation, which That's is right. something we've never seen before. Fill us in on what, the, what this test is and, and what you folks will do to support it. Yeah, um, I hope, uh, oh, I'm certain Mark Kelly will be able to uh, provide more information as the commander of the flight and, and helping with the, you know, performing the fly around itself. But uh, essentially what we will do is uh, we will collect data on the original rendezvous. So um, STORM is a device that uses um, uh, cameras, essentially, visual navigation systems to look at uh, reflectors and objects on um, the space station as we approach. Um, to provide guidance and navigation information to the approaching vehicle. So um, we have a laptop computer on the flight deck and it's actually my job to monitor the functions of the laptop computer and report the status to the ground and, and uh, understand whether or not it's operating in the way that we expect as we're approaching because what they're going to try to do is uh, use the initial approach data to help um, uh, calibrate their sensors. Um, so that they can relate visual images back to distance and position within the software and the, and the hardware itself. And then when we undock, we'll do the standard space station fly around. So we'll undock, we'll do one loop around, one lap around, and when we get right back to where, just about where we started from for the undock, then we'll go up around and um, depart out to uh, something like 250,000 feet or maybe further. Um, but it's quite a ways out uh, on the back side of the space station. And then we'll begin a, uh, a second approach back into the station, I think to within about 600 feet um, is, is the closest we'll get. And on the way back in, they will again collect data on the approach, um, this time hopefully having already done some calibrations with the, with the instruments because of the initial approach, but also this is again just data collection and calibration of their images further so that, you know, in the future if they do additional tests or it's actually used for, you know, operationally for the sole navigational inputs, um, the, the device and hardware would be ready to go. And this was with an eye toward future vehicles. It to, is, to it is. It would be a future uh, rendezvous system for you know, whatever wants to utilize that system.
STS 134 is the last scheduled flight of Endeavor, still gathering data on new, <laughs> for new that vehicles it, even as it we is. go. It is, yeah. yeah. Um, what are your thoughts about this shuttle's place in the history of human space flight and, and the work that's been done in the shuttle program? Uh, you mean Endeavor or the yeah. shuttle overall? Both. I mean, I mean um, you know, all of the vehicles are special and unique and they've all flown their you know, really just a small complement of what they were designed for. Maybe not in years, but certainly flight life, they were all designed for 100 missions, and we're seeing, you know, mid-30s missions out of, I think, each vehicle. Um, you know, my only experience on a spacecraft previous to this was Atlantis, and it was a great space shuttle. It did its job, and uh, we flew back. I'm sure Endeavour will perform uh, just the same way, and they've all done very unique things just, you know, just as the shuttle program itself has done special and unique things uh, for us in history. So, um, you know, my own my own feeling is that yes, indeed, it's it's time if we're going to change our focus from low Earth orbit. Um, the shuttle has done its job in building the space station. Um, it would be desirable to have a plan that was overlapping or some capability that was overlapping with, with the space shuttle. It doesn't look like we're going to be there uh, with the U.S. you know, U.S. or, you know, NASA-based program, uh, but I suspect that we will get there in a matter of time. It may not even be, you know, in my career. It may not, I'm, I'm assuming it'll be in my lifetime, but, um, you know, I don't think we're going to stop exploring or flying in space uh, because we're retiring the space shuttles. It's certainly done a great job up till now. You're going to be flying this mission right around a couple of significant anversaries. You got the on April 12th, the 50th anniversary of the first human space flight, mm -hmm. and the 30th anniversary of the first shuttle flight, and then in early May, the 50th anniversary of the first American space mm -hmm. flight. What are I, your thoughts about you being in space right around the, the time that well, these things are being commemorated? You know, may, maybe it's fitting if if uh, if 134. Uh, you know, remains as the final space shuttle flight. Maybe that's the appropriate time to fly it, is uh, when we're marking the anniversary of all these other great uh, beginnings in space flight. Uh, we'll mark a great end, uh, which will hopefully lead to another great beginning. You know, I I don't think we will. St we're going to stop exploring. We just, I don't think humans are capable of not exploring, especially outer space. We look up into the stars every night and wonder what's up there. Things have changed an awful lot in the 50 years since Gagarin and Shepard flew. Look 50 years in the future and tell me where you think mm. we're going to be then. I think we'll be on Mars, or at least have gone to Mars. And I hope that we will have the capability for sustained presence on the moon and that we will be utilizing the resources that we think are there, that we know are there, and those that we have no idea are there, but they're just waiting for us to go and, and uh, you know, take advantage of them. And, and, and utilize you know, utilize what we have as our nearest neighbor.